If we're going to survive into the next century, the McKinsey of tomorrow will be unrecognizable to the McKinsey of today. This is only the beginning of the opportunity for consulting. In a world where 70% of the population has never used a telephone, the scope is infinite. Bad surfing, great sport. You go out into the waves and you see a wave that really is gathering steam. And you decide that's where you're gonna put your board. And you ride that baby, you ride it all the way until you say this is beginning to peter out. It's pure, raw economics of information technology and economics of globalization which are moving the ship. And so you've got this massive new industry of consultants, that's for sure. And the dream of the consultant is actually to be in the vanguard of the current fad. And that the fad becomes very much associated with you. Okay, so this is a sand tray. Um, and the goal here is to use any of the objects, figures that are on this shelf to create a world, the world within the sand tray, which is a world in which innovation process at the firm works in an optimal fashion, works in, if you will, an ideal fashion. If you could have <laughs> the innovation capabilities of the firm work to their very, very best, the best you could imagine, what would that world be like? This is the newest face of management consulting, a $40 billion industry that is growing faster than its clients. But consultancy is no longer just about the bottom line, boosting output, cutting jobs. It's no longer about counting heads. It's about what goes on inside them. These are accountants from PricewaterhouseCoopers. They are taking part in a workshop on creativity and innovation. It is led by new style management guru, John Cahill in San Francisco. We are actually tremendously excited about Santray. We feel we've just begun to scratch the surface in terms of how it can be used. The psychological reality of this is understood much as ideas in a dream are understood, almost like a kind of corporate primary process. The gargoyle, the fallen bear, the caveman, the dancing girls in bikinis are all characters in a corporate drama. What they're doing is translating an inner picture of what they think the ideal system for innovation might be. So what was it like to work together on the Sandra? I just really enjoyed being able to be creative. It's kind of allowed me to think what, what um, Heather was thinking when, when she put that, you know, those people there in the canoe and I was, oh, okay, now I know what she's thinking. You don't really need to be in an office place to work. When we first started out, we sort of had different concepts. And so we'd go to get items that represented that. And as it evolved, it started coming together, and so the things that we get or take away, I mean, I saw a lot of people just say, well, my original thought of that is no longer applicable to this new environment. And so that, that whole process of the changing environment, every time you go away and come back, it's entirely different. I don't see any headquarters here. I don't see any CEO here. Um, I don't see functional business units here. What I see are certain capabilities that are about experimentation, which by definition is fun and you know maybe kind of neo-primitive. But I don't see actually anything that reminds me of a traditional organization. I see rather um, agendas. Our knowledge of human behavior in the organization 
uh, of human behavior in relation to issues of knowledge management and innovation and corporate flexibility, to name just a few buzzwords du jour, uh, are just at a, a very embryonic stage. In this particular group, there are people with tremendous technology, uh, literacy, people who understand, who get the new economy, because in fact their job is going to the new companies, the rocket ship companies, the internet companies, the cool companies, and saying, we may be accountants, but we also understand your needs and we are really good people to work with. We have so many really smart, motivated, charged people in our organization. And if we could just pull them together, we could just create an amazing amount of change. They'll figure out, well, you have an opportunity or you have a problem, go solve it. That's why you're up there. You're not at the bottom there. And don't come to me with solutions. Don't come to me with problems. John Kayo typically charges $40,000 a day to advise clients. The Idea Factory is the very latest in consulting. He doesn't use conventional tools. There are no flip charts or overhead projectors. Instead, a graphic artist is helping the group set out their problems and frustrations. They may work for a large and conventional accounting firm, but they're the wired generation, and their company wants to keep them. Not probably, but you'll see the value added of having... Creativity is absolutely at a premium. The people who have the best ideas and have them quickest are the ones who come to market first and who can make the best profits. In this contractual employment world where um, you don't show loyalty to me, I don't show loyalty to you, um, I have to find ways of attracting you to stay with me. And I want the brightest, the cleverest and the most creative people to stay for longer. So I, I will invest in you, I will invest in your creativity and try and create an environment for you where you feel that you are fulfilled and you will want to stay with this employer because how else can I make you bright people stay? Well, I think it's, um... Hello. The actors are used to working with business people. We they also understand John Keo's own particular language. Good morning. Um, and maybe we need Erica for that as well. We used improv acting as a way of testing out hypotheses about what customers like or what the dilemmas of managing innovation are in an organization. At around 11, so it'll really be the three of us then as the final facilitation team. Um, we ought to do a quick and dirty um, dilemma, Pandora's box kind of thing. But if they come in and they do this and they actually have something kinesthetic they can do that they bring to their seats, that's even better. That's they walk into our space and the typical reaction is a slight smile crosses their, their face, their shoulders drop about an inch. And within about five minutes, they're engaged in a set of activities that have the, the flavor of a flow state. So, of course, one could say, well, is this one of these California things? We don't do the analytical work for them. We discover things with them. Keo spent 14 years as a professor teaching creativity at Harvard Business School. He's a jazz musician who's produced film and theater, and he has a degree in psychiatry. The point here of this little demo is that all of those notes were brand new. Um, I didn't really consider anything other than getting up here and trying to empty my mind as much as possible. Most organizations can't do that. Most professionals can't do that. It's anxiety provoking to leave all of that identity behind to try to find the white space. So with that, um, I'm going to introduce uh, uh, this is just incredible. One minute of thinking I have the right idea means I'm a minute behind other people who are still starting. I, I, I got it all here. I can do it. I can innovate. I, yeah, I got optimism. Boy, am I optimistic. Nobody listens to me. Does, does somebody want to take um, uh, one of the dilemmas that were discussed in the intro and maybe offer that as a subject matter for uh, the actors to work on? I gave my children up for adoption so I would have enough time to work on that proposal, sir. All right, Freeze, uh, would you like to try a different thing? Yeah. Okay, I, try I, another I, choice. I want a passion in their voice. I mean, okay. what the hell are you doing? More passion. <laughs> <laughs> of course I'm going to put my name on the whole project. What? Yeah. Wait a minute, what? I appreciate that you gave me the opportunity to research and, and work through this. And without you, there was no way that I could possibly have come up with this project. OK, Freeze, what would you like to see in this scene? Where would you like it to go? I don't like this. And the reason is you're calling the shots, not him. Okay. I understand where you're coming from, but 
you're letting him in your proposal, okay? So you're calling the shots. It's not, you're not apologizing for him to put his name on a proposal. Hold on a second. Um, Would you be willing to come up and say that to him now? Yeah. Okay. Back step more out. than happy. All right. Let's go back to the beginning of the same, of the same scene. And, and uh... Uh, Thanks for coming in. Uh, I love your proposal. It's really terrific. Thank you for the work. I'm going to present it this afternoon. Of course, I'm going to put my name on it. No. Whoa. Since you said we're a team and you have reviewed the proposal, do you have any feedback, anything you'd like to change, any input, anything that you'd like to contribute? Well, I, I, I skimmed it, basically. There are a couple of spelling mistakes. Skimmed it? I mean, it looks That's good. good. I like it looks good. Yeah. Freeze one second, if you will. William, I want you to be changed by this. Not, don't drop your status real low, but hear what he, really hear him and go, you know, and say, I've always believed. I have always believed that, the, uh, that those lower in the status in the company have to bow to those higher in status. And I'm not finding you're doing that now. And perhaps uh, you, being a new person, have things to offer me. Now, the way we're going to do it, we're doing it my way. <laughs> you know, take it or leave it. But if you'd like to have your name on a proposal, what I'd like you is not to skip it. I want you to read it carefully, study it, be able to answer questions because you're sitting on a hot seat. So here's how I'm, how I'm suggesting we do this together as a team, as opposed to you just putting your name on a proposal. Now you're talking. Okay, we'll end the scene there. Okay. For consultants empowering and developing the human side of organizations are the new money spinners. After a decade of decimating the ranks of middle managers, companies are looking to consultants to get the most from those who have survived. In some respects, the world has never been more receptive to consultants. I think the role of the consultant in some areas will also evolve into being a creative partner, into being a colleague, an ally, whose job it is to create a sense of possibility for the organization that it cannot create for itself. From California to London's Covent Garden and the offices of Smythe Dorwood Lambert, another of the new breed of creative consultants, SDL are brainstorming in what they call a fun and wacky sort of way. With integrity. Um, uh, what do you call it? Um, brown ricey. Yeah. Wholesome. 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 That's it. Healthy. I'm quite interested in this snake. <laughs> Because I, I think whatever we do has got to have bite mm. and, um, and edge and also a sense of danger. So this yeah. is natural. And at the same time, people don't like picking it up because they're worried they might get bitten. SDL consultants Liz Richards and Liz Stanley have been working with software giant Microsoft UK to encourage Microsoft employees to adopt company values. We've got to form. For SDL, this is a potential new stream of work. Early adopters, early majority. Mm. Steve would like. Yeah, well, that's what I thought. It's yes. called putting the wow yes. into yes. values. It's, um, I think it's written by the same guy that does all the stuff about fads. Oh, Abrahamson. Mm. And he's got terms like this as well. He yeah, talks that, about how. Um, my resource packs at home. No, my resource packs at home as well. I'd be quite keen to get him to kind of co-create one with us. Yeah. It would actually be quite good to show him a really widespread of ideas, because he's saying, I want you to be really creative. Microsoft has a problem. They've cornered the market in computer software, but the research shows too many customers find them uncaring and unresponsive. We weren't good at managing people. You, know, you, you see famous quotes which say people are our greatest asset, but then we weren't doing an awful lot with it. And so value sort of came out of that, that we knew that to take this company forward, and we looked three years out, the only way to do that is to bring in something like values and treat the people better. In a very competitive world, it's hard to be differentiated from your competition. So you will try, as um, a manufacturer or a service provider, to have a set of values to say that we care about the customer in a particular way or we give our service in a particular way. In order to do that, you have to have your staff buy into that. You have to have your staff accept that the values you are talking about in your advertising are the ones that you will find when you hit the high street branch. And they have... Ta -da. Six values. Um, respect for the customer, entrepreneurial spirit, cooperation, integrity, passion and empowerment. 
We're now at the point where we have a new sponsor. The guy who was our sponsor has moved off to another bit of Microsoft. And the new sponsor is keen to kind of, yeah, we've done that good, serious stuff, but we need to get a bit of wow into it. And that's really where we need your help. So literally, five minutes to just walk around, reading ideas, and start picking up the ideas that you think are particularly good. <laughs> so right. there. You have no integrity, no money. <laughs> SDL are doing this work on spec, hoping that the best ideas will appeal to Steve Harvey, who's recently been put in charge of commissioning consulting work at Microsoft. But their new man at Microsoft has yet to be convinced. So putting me in charge of this particular project has been quite good fun because I'm not one of their greatest lovers, if you like. That's the sad reality of it. We do need those guys to actually help us do what we need to do. Our resource model won't let us have enough resources around to do that sort of work internally. The SDL director in charge of keeping Microsoft happy is former PR executive Anthony Goodman. He is off to explain the value of a continuing relationship through good times and bad. You go into every client relationship wanting to have a long-term client relationship. Um, that is what being a consultant is about. We're not quick hit merchants. We just don't want to go in and wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, uh, and disappear. You're hoping to make lasting change in the organisation, and that implies a certain level of uh, involvement. Consultants don't collect large fees for reporting on the excellence of the existing situation. And the, the modern breed of consultants emphasise implementation and their desire to stick around for as long as it takes to put their remedies into effect, as much as they do their recommendations in the first place. SDL's pilot project was to be the first important step in relating how well Microsoft staff live the values to how much they get paid. It's not going well. It seems no one filled out the appropriate forms. OK, so just to recap on what the principles of the review and reward process were... That As is often the case, it is unclear whether the client or the consultant is responsible. The task is to apportion blame diplomatically. Because of that, I think there's one piece of this that we haven't talked about yet at all, which is that we all drop the ball on this one. That's my own personal belief that everyone in this room dropped the ball on this, and Tony as well that we did the forms, did the training, and then never stepped back in to test the process, see how it was going. So, Colin Anty, as our little consultant, what would you recommend? Little. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very sized experience, yeah. Um, <laughs> what I wonder, rather than going into is there something around actually analysing what the risks are of those different mm. options? I'll start, if we to said... his, I'll start to hear his view first before okay. we pop off now. But no problem comes without opportunity. We probably all have got slightly different views on this. One view which I have, um, you see our strength as being primarily about initiating things and then it's up to Microsoft to take them on and, and do them and kind of make them kind of local and fit. And I, I wondered in that analysis actually whether there wasn't a piece missing, and I, I think we certainly all felt there was a piece missing, in that there could be something we can do to actually help you through these things. I think it would be really good if you could actually clarify for us what our licence is. Because I think the reason why some of these things didn't happen is because I think we were a bit unclear about what our role actually was. And we'd be better off actually fixing this process, making this work, make it easy to operate and understand, bring employees back into the loop in June. That's the immediate next step. Obviously, the view which I was putting forward about the lessons which we'd learned and which we very much wanted to share with the client is that if you use a consultancy like us purely to initiate things and then to come back at the end to review uh, what's actually happened, that's probably not going to get the job done the way you want to have it done. But how they're clever is they, they go around and work with different parts of the business and never really get tied down with one owner for the whole time. They've been with us so long now, they've almost become risk adverse in the way that they do their work. And, you know, I want to, you know, just today get, get decisions out of them, get their views, it's quite tough work at times. Mm. So they make a good living out of us. We actually know Microsoft pretty well, but at the end of the day, they know their organisation much better than we can and that we ever can. Um, so it's always trying to get that balance of how much they should do and drive and how much we should do and drive. But what can we learn in terms of going forward and making sure that we are clear about the rules?
to be a true rainmaker, the, the most important thing is getting the trust of the potential client. Being able to look that person in the eye and convince them that you can help them with their problems. These executives have serious problems and they want somebody that they can truly trust and somebody who will really help them with their problem. Undaunted by their cool reception at the last meeting, the SDL consultants prepare to pitch their scheme to put the wow factor into values to the still skeptical Steve Harvey. We know Microsoft pretty well and we know Steve. And the nice thing about because of our relationship with Microsoft is that because we know quite a bit about their organisation, it'll be a lot of debate and dialogue. This was Steve's idea to have all this done up. So. SDL have selected the best ideas from their brainstorming session to present in a five-hour pitch to Steve Harvey. But their proposals must fit his agenda, and he has the company budget to worry about. The idea we have had, based on a lot of the learnings and stuff we've talked about, and just too many, you know, a lot of values, too many behaviours to remember, is to just pick a value a month or six weeks, yeah. you know, ideally a month. And to create a kind of dedicated zone or environment in which people can really start to explore the behaviours and the implications and discuss how they might apply that to, to their, their work. And then to link into that a more kind of wow campaign element to generate the awareness throughout the building and, and kind of informally to start stimulating a lot of the debate. And one of the things that we think is, is that we need to actually kind of capture those stories. And it could be as people go through this experience that each group captures its stories. And there's either a website or there's a graffiti board, or we have a storyteller who captures them. Mm. And one of the ideas that we, we thought of was kind of throughout those campaigns to have values in unusual places. So just quite kind of tongue-in-cheek stuff that makes people look, why not sponsor a competition that they all design a painting for a value? I mean, you could, you know... No, we like that one, Liz. That's a nice little nugget. Good. After several hours, Harvey seems to like their proposals, but he has something tougher in mind. I'll give you an example of what I want to do at the moment. It's we keep paying people too much money to bugger off out of here because they're no good. I don't think we're dismissing our people on values-based decisions yet. Mm -hmm. So I want to do a piece of work that says, right, let's look at everyone that's been here 18 months now. Mm -hmm. Before they get to their two-year financial watershed. Mm -hmm. And let's test them against values and see how they're doing. Yeah, yeah. So you'd like me I to mean, do I that, would you? <laughs> yeah. Well, you could also look at who gets promoted. Because if it's built into the promotion, Project. All the people who got promoted was do they exhibit various behaviour, or is it if you, you know if you don't you don't get promoted? Well, it depends how much you want to build on the positive case studies. Because it always you, you'd like to do a bit of a bit of stick. As I, well, actually, as a bit of I actually think in this in our environment, why it actually works is to do the, is to do the stick mm -hmm. carrot. Yeah. The verdict to me was it's one of the most useful afternoons I've spent with these guys. Last year was very much about you know sporadic bits of work huge activities, different times, big costs. We're never really getting good value out of it, and hence we've got a, key, a lot of key learnings. Uh, a lot of key learnings, no refunds, unfortunately. It would be great to work with him, yeah. Actually, I don't think this does mean more work for them. Some of the ideas they're saying that would be more work haven't been accepted yet, in terms of doing these nice little sessions of groups of eight people, and you can imagine there's 750, 800 people on site, that's 100 sessions. You know, when my immediate answer was, I can't see the guys buying into investing in that sort of time, not when we're investing in coaching and leadership training as well. You know, so those are the ones that pick up their ideas. And they're obviously, you know, by having sort of the themed values every month is another way of sustaining nice income levels. Uh, but we haven't bought into that yet either. I know my budget for the year. <laughs> I think we will um, certainly... Uh, no. There's no certainty about it. I think we will probably have a role to work with Steve to help shape his thinking um, and to, to develop ideas together. The extent of involvement and implementation of those, I don't know. Um, but I think in terms of suggesting things, working through ideas, keeping that conceptual overview, I think there's a strong role for us there. It's sometimes hard for clients to really know if they have a good consultant or not for many years. Some of the types of problems that the consultants are working on are very long-term in nature, and it won't be for five or sometimes 10 years till they will be able to determine whether that advice was good advice or not. 
The wow factor work carried on for several months, but then went quiet. Suddenly, six months later, a new executive gave the project the go-ahead. Now, historically, we've moved into the 80s and the 90s. There's been much more of a focus on results. So rather than consultants writing reports, there's been much more of a focus on getting things done and consultants staying through with the client to actually get the result. So you've got a great business system. Uh, it works because you have so many companies who are hoping that somebody externally has the answer and they can just pay for it and unleash it and somehow that will make them uh, instantly uh, world class. And now consultancy is going global. To an outsider, Egypt can be a chaotic reminder of the difference between Europe and the Middle East. But another country, another opportunity. The consultants believe their brand of know-how works as well here as at home, particularly when the job is the creation of a new mobile phone company. In July, the Egyptian government privatized its struggling mobile phone network and sold it to a new multinational company called Mobinil. They brought in Gemini, a London-based consulting firm, to help them relaunch the service. The new company is struggling to keep up with demand, while handling the cultural problem of setting up in Cairo with French and American investors and with an Egyptian controlling interest. Gemini is virtually running the project while trying to make it appear that Mobinil is in charge. Give it yeah. to the customer, and uh, here just we accept, it, uh, accept yeah. money. But now you are handling the new concepts, not the old. The greatest thing for me, I think, for consulting is when you do what I call the Chinese water torch. You keep letting these ideas go out, and then a few weeks later you suddenly hear the client saying, I've thought of a great idea, I think we should do this. And you don't say, he told you so. You just sit back and think, ah, the Chinese water talked his words, they've now accepted it as their idea. And that's what management's all about, is getting other people to do what you want them to do, because they want to do it. Wake him up. Both consultant and client are jammed into the Cairo Hilton. The 16-strong Gemini consulting team come from all around the world, but their experience of Egypt is limited to the call centre and this hotel. Gemini has paid £300,000 a month plus all expenses to get the project underway. Most have never worked in telecommunications before, but they believe their experience in finance, computing and management can fit any situation. After all, they've got a template. It's called Telco in a Box. Telco in a box is basically telecoms in a box. So we basically take a ribbon off the box and out pops a company. We help set up mobile phone companies and, and we call that Telco in a box. So if you want a new mobile phone company, we can give it to you in a box and we know how long it's going to take. We, we know what the challenges are, we know what kind of management are required, what organization is needed, what systems are required, what the technological needs are. And having done it three or four times, um, we can do it very quickly. At the hotel, Peter Day prepares for a crisis meeting. Moby Neal has announced new low prices in the local press. The response has been good, too good. The call centre is inundated with requests and can't cope. The board of directors and chief executive Osman Sultan are meeting to decide what to do. Peter needs to put a positive spin in events while nudging the directors towards his solution. Every success always has things that you need to do the fine tuning. So these are often fine tuning, I think. We've mentioned already that we've got three times the usual call rate. About 22% of calls were abandoned on Sunday, not surprisingly, because of the volume. And as of last night, it was around 8 o'clock, we had about a 30% rate. Right. For the day. So it's in a meeting, it's really a lot of it's trying to not look like I'm too much in control. Uh, it's very important to maintain credibility that the client is in control. We certainly need some additional resources and a crisis plan, I think, to say, you know, we've got 500 people in the company. This is critical to our success in terms of loyalty, retention. We can't afford to be seen to be failing. We can't be victims of our own success. I would like to see a specific task force. Mm. Cherry, you take the lead on this, because this is important. We cannot be victim of the success, and this, the picture must be really very, very clean. 
and I would suggest that within the coming uh, 24 hours there is a meeting of this task force. It's all about communication. At a certain point in time, you just feel that two sides are not communicating. And you have to find out what's going on. And the way you do it is just by talking with the other Gemini representative. How was that you say this one? Was it going ahead well, or? Yes and no. What else? Bill printing and delivery request for proposal. There was a draft submitted to IT, and we're waiting for feedback from, uh, from, uh, from IT. So does anyone? from IT knows about it? Didn't we have in our checklist, I mean, training for CSRs? So how, how did... Right. Just to, without prolonging it, I think the important message we keep coming up with is that when people are making decisions on projects, they mustn't work in isolation. This is what keeps happening at the minute. No one should underestimate the amount of information that other departments need. And we need to have in our implementation plan, when does it come in? A week before, we need to make sure we communicate it to our staff way before it ever gets to a customer. And all of us in this room who are planning these things need to make sure we really have got things planned well and trained to our staff before we launch them on the public. There's nothing worse than us not knowing internally what's yeah. happening externally. So That's it's a message for everyone, everyone. We all make the same mistake. dealing with the internet, dealing with globalization. They really, those two phenomena really are fundamentally changing the world. I mean, the hype is ridiculous, the hype is out of control. On the other hand, the reality is just as ridiculous. The backroom opera operations of a, of a London bank can be performed as easily in rural Ireland or rural India as they can be in the city. and so. That's, that's for real. But does the consultant's view of a dynamic, interchangeable, wired world fit the reality on the ground in Egypt? It is an incredibly hierarchical society, I think, more than any I've come across. Um, we had one manager who wanted to move a PC about two foot across his desk, but called his office boy in and waited for him to arrive and watched him move his PC before he could carry on working. Now, the discussion we'll be having with the CEO is what type of company do we become? Uh, do we become an Egyptian company with its natural cultural hierarchical status and where you're of a certain status, you don't do certain menial tasks? But does that really bode well for what should perhaps be an international company on an international stage because a GSM mobile phone company is competing with another competitor here in Egypt, who I'm sure we have international standards, and they're competing with people just across the borders. It's here on the right, sorry, the World Trade Center. Part of the task of making the Gemini blueprint fit here falls to 23-year-old Melissa Tatra. Cairo is her first overseas project for Gemini.
Melissa is working with call centre staff who have their own way of doing things. She is trying to introduce them to Gemini best practice. Everything moves in a, a slightly different pace. Um, things happen when they get done. No one really operates according to deadlines or according to um, time frames. You set up a meeting and most of the time people aren't there yet. Um, you say that you want something done by Friday and it gets done by next Friday. Uh, nothing, the things in the US or in the UK would take 10 minutes, take 10 days here. So it's a, you, but you get used to it after, been, after having been here for so long. It, I don't expect things to happen when I, when I schedule them anymore. Would you mind asking the four people from the back office to come down here? I want to really get into the detail of what they do every day. Um, and I don't want them to look at this and say, oh, these are the things we're supposed to be doing. We're going to go through what they're already doing, the types of inquiries they're handling. I want them to feel like they're part of creating this plan to get here. I want to start by you just brainstorming everything you do every day. What types of customer problems you're facing, um, what are you doing to handle them, everything from when you arrive in the morning till you leave in the afternoon. Everything you do. Okay. Strange countries and strange calls, they never they don't. know nothing about them. Okay. I mean, printing all out the, the detailed bills mm -hmm. from right. last week or things like this. These are inquiries for dropped calls. Okay. There will be people who are, who are required to deal with um, saving customers. When customers are trying to leave the network, mm -hmm. there will be people who will have to work with the call center and the walk-in save team to send out gifts to these customers, to give them credits, to make them happy so they don't leave the network. So that will be some of your job. We really need to make sure that all of you can do everything Okay, so 4 p.m. on Mondays and Thursdays, the five of us will sit down and talk about what you've been up to. Okay? We've got so much to do. <laughs> well, there's a bunch of new tariffs and so on. Yeah. It seems like we're doing nothing with it. It's disgusting. Have you been over the far side? To, to look? Yes. Yeah, just wander over there and see how busy they are this minute. They're doing nothing. I'll walk around there in a minute and have a look. Peter Day has arrived armed with an emergency plan. Now fine, but I think what we should have is a crisis plan, even if we don't bring it into action, but it's agreed. So the minute you need it, we just go click and everyone knows what to do. Click. Click. <laughs> <laughs> Melissa has been pulled in to persuade the sales team that they too have a role to play in coping with the overflow. I'm here to give you a little bit of training on the new tariffs that Moby Nail has launched this past weekend. So you guys will be answering um, calls from prospective customers on the new tariffs and how they can go about signing up to join Moby Nail. Okay, so does everyone understand that? No, yes, yes, okay. This is my way of dealing with stress. At home, I would run outside every day. For about my first week, <laughs> um, I went running outside. You get people hissing at you and following you, and it's just not worth it. You come back more angry than you were before you left. And uh, in July, when it's 100 degrees in Cairo, I was not wearing sweats. <laughs> Six months later, Mobinil is still under siege from its customers, but it's the top performer in the Cairo stock market. Einstein said, many of the things you can count, don't count. Many of the things you can't count, really count. What really counts at McKinsey? And where do we go from here? McKinsey's answer to its own question is, go global. But there is one country at least that is resistant to the consultant's worldwide blueprint and is defying their neat and tidy logic. 
With the collapse of communism, McKinsey was one of the many firms that came to Moscow to pursue Russian gold at the end of the privatization rainbow. The expected bonanza has turned very sour. Bill Lewis is a McKinsey globetrotter, his job to travel the world evaluating economies for clients. Lewis has come to Moscow to puzzle out why the consultant's model of best practice isn't working here. Ten years after the consultants first set foot in Russia, the economy has collapsed. The futures market stands empty. The banks have crashed and there is no money in the economy. McKinsey Company, добрый день. Here's at the meeting now, unfortunately. Even McKinsey's have felt the pinch, reducing their Moscow office staff by 60. These modern-day Jesuits spreading their gospel of deregulation have run up against their sternest test. For Lewis, the answer is to preach the gospel a little louder to attract the reluctant foreign investor. McKinsey's Global Institute measures countries against its blueprint of economic performance and encourages investors who it has hoped will buy in their expertise. The Global Institute is the agent within McKinsey of, of working with my fellow partners in the firm to identify the potential to bring best practice to Russia. Many of the best practice firms will already are and will continue to be and will hopefully be in a, in, to an increasing degree interested in investing in Russia over the long term and they will then bring with their investment best practice and, and that, that's the way most of it happens actually through foreign direct investment. Now in that process uh, the, the global best practice firms may very well engage a consultant, sometimes McKinsey, to help them identify where the best opportunities are. You fit with the eccentric Russian mix of Western imports and old-style Soviet social ideals? I think there's a very large tendency in the way in which we've approached Eastern Europe to believe that there is a single model of what works and we know what it is. And actually, as we're starting to understand now, you know, these countries are very different backgrounds, very different environments, and require very different prescriptions. Western investors are still failing to grasp how the country works. And because there are quotas in place, that they will only so take an outright, so much. So outright protection. Huge drop for four years, 1990 to 1994. Bill Lewis struggles with the improbable notion of hundreds of unprofitable steel mills that in America would have been closed down years ago. And there is lots and lots of tiny little plants that all over the place that are not really economical and that are falling off. And we'll, we'll see it as soon but as we those, I mean, this is like food retailing. I mean, that we've got mom and pops <laughs> <laughs> in the steel industry. That, this is, this yeah. is your Chinese, we make steel in the backyard. That's right. I mean, is there something of this here um, in Russia that, that I mean, doesn't they, exist in other countries? It's, it's all relative because the small plant here still makes 200,000 tons of steel. And then the issue is why haven't they had to shut down? Why haven't they run out of cash? I will see they have. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> then, they just haven't shut down. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'd like to see how you do that. I, I'd like to run without cash myself, too. So you basically be shut down all those plants. You'd never miss them. Yes. And you would raise productivity by 25% yes. right yes. off the top. Yes. Moscow's poor are used to existing on very little, bartering a few goods in the spring.
Street, but now even the biggest Russian corporations have no cash. Instead, they are forced to pay their workers and their creditors in the goods they manufacture. They pay no tax, so in the end the government too will be forced to barter. The barter economy is something that is not very well studied or understood anymore because basically nobody uses it anymore and hasn't for a long time. But it's suddenly cropped up here in Russia. So they have the goods and then they would have to redistribute them in the, in the economy and it would have to work out this huge plan again. And so we circle back to where we started. In another Russian idiosyncrasy, many industrial enterprises themselves make all the everyday items that in the West would be bought in. Uh, they do their own boiler construction, they do transportation, they do their own trucking to the customer. Uh, they make furniture and consumer goods, they make plates, they make all sorts of weird stuff. Milk, bread, uh, you name it, they produce it to a certain extent, chairs. So they are fully integrated kind of operation where I think they even make their own paper. I'm not sure about paper, but... Their own little economy. They're, they're own, their own little economy, they make their own meat, they're fully self-sufficient. They don't trust the, <laughs> the rest of the country. <laughs> so with that, why don't we have some lunch? Good, I mean, I think the other thing that's emerging is that Russia is so different from anything else where markets exist. We are still uh, that figuring it, out the difference. It's, it's yeah. just going to take us longer to get to the bottom of everything. It, it, this is unique. I mean, talk about US exceptionalism. It's really not that. It's Russian exceptionalism. I mean, that's the economy that's really exceptional today. We're going to start cement in 15 minutes. Okay. In every country, the McKinsey method is to bring on side heavy hitters from government and industry. Political leaders like former Prime Minister Kirienko would provide the right profile. So it's both improvement of the ultimate relationship on which our consulting services are based, but it also is a general reputation building aspect that, in some sense, money can't buy. Okay. Whether the, whether the, whether the Russian government is going and of course we know that there's been a fault, but... Lunch for Bill Lewis and the head of the Moscow McKinsey team means persuading a director of one of Russia's huge oil and banking conglomerates of the value of the McKinsey view. You can only observe that uh, Russia is medieval. I mean, it's like, it is literally like, uh, you know, Europe 400, 500 years ago uh, at this point in time. Right? But I think there are formats that could meet the needs of Russia. And we thought about this when we looked at Brazil and, and Korea, where you don't have the same automobile penetration, the layout of the cities is different, and so on, and still be able to offer a much more efficient format that serves the local community much more efficiently than the current retailers that are there, which, if they're not medieval, at least they're not, uh, not in efficient formats. So I don't think we would necessarily say that Moscow's going to look exactly like uh, an American city or a European city. It's going to evolve in the way that meets the needs of uh, Russian consumers in a more productive way. But the McKinsey view of the world has clearly yet to convince people here. So with this wave of market reform, McKinsey's practice around the world has grown dramatically in, in Brazil, in Korea, in India, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, so this global trend actually has been very favorable towards the expansion on a global basis of consulting services, at least for McKinsey. And that, at the turn of the millennium, is the state of play for McKinsey's and their fellow masters of the universe. Thwarted for now in Russia, but elsewhere in the world in increasing presence. The ever more powerful players behind the corporate throne. intellectual capital is a firm's only appreciable asset. 
we're not in the genteel, mannerly world of industrial age economics anymore. The growth of the industry has been nothing short of remarkable. It's more than doubled in the last seven years. We expect that the industry will be over $110 billion by the end of the year 2000. Is consultancy influential? Yes, it's a much more influential profession in terms of both doing the work, the idea part of it, because there is more of a premium placed on ideas than was the case 25 or 30 years ago when we kind of knew how to do the industrial shtick. People are at the center stage of what managers need to be concerned about. What we're talking about today with all of the knowledge management and innovation imperatives and flexibility and speed that are desired from companies, these are all qualities that ultimately come from people. And human nature is the ultimate black box in, in the management context because we know painfully little about how to influence the human agenda towards desired ends. It's hard to see the management consultant cycle being broken because no sooner have they kind of in invented one solution to a problem than a new problem will have emerged, possibly because of the previous solution, which mean, well, I will need either these consultants or a slightly different set of consultants to solve them. All of these fads come back to the consultants and academics saying there's gold in them, there are hills, the hills being the clients. You get uh, almost what you read about happening at the turn of the last millennium uh, in this millennium, which is the, is the belief that somewhere out there is the answer and the profit is going to come.